Okay. And uh, Arian, actually, I'm, I was, you know, my presentation was going to start, you know, with, with connecting back to yours uh, uh, as a recap. But anyway, so thank you all for, for allowing us to talk about ITMF again. Uh, you know, Arian did a wonderful presentation talking about how ITMF and the work that we're doing at IDEA um, is being adjusted at MPEG. Uh, and, you know, our, our mission at Otoy is to build software tools, services that support artists and content creators. And along the way, you know, we've been touching a lot of different standards, bodies, and groups, and we've worked closely with, um, you know, the GLTF working group. Um, USD is a big part of our pipeline. And about, uh, I guess, about six years ago, Arian brought me into MPEG to help bring some of the um, work that we we're doing with our own interchange format into the mix. And uh, and that's sort of how we we got ITMF up and running. Let's see, does it want me to go to the next slide? So, you know, just to connect back to where uh, Arian's last presentation ended, ITMF is a scene graph format. Uh, it's, uh, you know, effect effectively an umbrella format that is designed to provide agnostic um, rendering to future display technology that can include AR, VR, light field displays. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, at IDEA working on documenting this, this graph. I mean, it's largely an XML file that connects to many other subformats, USD and GLTF, you know, which obviously is a big focus of this group, uh, are both supported. So we have sort of these generic nodes that are, you know, responsible for geometry, volumes, so forth and so on, all the way to, you know, post-processing and uh, metadata for um, provenance and things like that. Uh, I think that, as Arian had said, you know, the, one of the goals we had was to provide an ecosystem that allows, uh, you know, equal ingestion of GLTF USD. Those are those are equal leaf nodes in, in ITMF, and um, to provide a spec that can be adapted and uh, ingested by other uh, standards. And you know, we we built. Uh, ITMF around XML is a starting point, but we could have a JSONified version, for example. Um, you can embed pieces of ITMF inside of a USD, inside of um, other data as well. Uh, there is a pretty well-documented um, spec that covers every node, every um, element that's in there. It's a, and it's a full rendering graph. And obviously, when, when you get to something like an Alembic or OSL or USD, it's, you know, those specs are effectively de you know, defined by their uh, you know, respective groups. We do provide some sort of ratification. We have, um, you know, validation and unit tests uh, for assets, and uh, and those things have been helpful in providing a pretty robust um, ecosystem. This worked for about twelve years. Uh, we've been supporting, uh, yeah, ITMF, which is now an open spec um, within our tools since uh, two thousand twelve, and we've also had various, sorry, I guess, adventures in, uh, you know, with different organizations and groups. Uh, this this goes back to our work with MPEG but also uh, with Facebook. Facebook was developing a six-dot camera system and they were looking at ITMF as a mechanism for representing um, you know, light field captures. And now we've got ports nerfs and other things that are even more interesting. Um, but to sort of sum up, I mean, the, the way that ITMF graph works, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have geometry, a render target and various other nodes. And those are again in XML or other similar um, you know, data format. Uh, there is support for things like VDB. You can point to um, to volumes. You can also point to an OSL shader that could define an SDF for a volume. And similarly, we have this, this idea of a, a module system. You can write it in scripts or you can write it in, in shader code or compute code that's defined to be portable. So you can create your own renderable types. That's how we get nerfs in there and the like. Uh, we have built um, you know, plugins for, I guess, now almost 30 different 3D tools that can import and export uh, ITMF. Uh, those have been pretty much necessary for a lot of the production work that we're doing, where we need to start, um, you know, the art in one, in one, you know, in one application, bring it to another. I think, you know, what we found when we were just doing USD or Alembic is a lot of things are missing. You know, Alembic doesn't have great, a great camera system. Um, USD, of course, is approaching, you know, really good material support. I mean, with Material X and things like that, but we've been leveraging ITMF to provide quiescent uh, transport between different applications for production. Uh, we've also built and done integrations with both Unity and Unreal, where you can take everything that's happening in a Unity or Unreal, you know, game or asset and spit that out as ITMF, load that into another application. So, you know, that's been um, out there for about four or five years. And um, we've also, you know, been very focused on bringing things from the real world into, um, you know, the render graph, into the ITMF render graph. And so, 
things like um, being able to really high quality um, captures of, of assets and, and people in this case yeah, through light stage and other similar high quality production ready capture formats has been a focus of ITMF. Uh, you know, I was calling out the Facebook work we did before. Uh, and you know, similarly, their plugins for Nuke and, um, and Premiere. Um, and of course, you know, as we're looking at adding support for USD, one of the things we decided to do in ITMF um, was allow effectively a module that just provides um, a render delegate, a Hydra render delegate to be plugged into the ITMF spec. And, um, and therefore we're able to uh, really just ingest other renderers, including Arnold and, and more that we'll show. So the idea is that with USD as a core component, Hydra's core component, um, everything that's in the ITMF uh, scene graph can be a, a Hydra scene delegate, which means we can plug that into um, arbitrary tools that support you know, that API and similarly renders can be brought back in. Uh, we've also been working with NVIDIA to build connectors to Omniverse, both for rendering, both for ingestion. Obviously, Omniverse is heavily USD based. And, um, and then just to sort of showcase some of the work on Unreal, uh, you know, with Unreal in particular, our goals have been to support things for virtual production, um, as well as real-time games. I'll be showing a lot of our work with uh, the Roddenberry Archive, which is a project that entirely built on ITMF. And, you know, it's, it's excellent to be able to bring in assets from Cinema 4D, high quality. We have a full translator to Unreal scene format uh, materials. It becomes a native Unreal object. We can make changes, export that out as ITMF. And similarly, you know, bring in other renders that are uh, hydro render delegates. You know, we can use the Unreal Path Tracer as well. And so this mixing and matching of both renderers and workflows um, is great. I mean, we've been dog fooding this tool ourselves and through IDEA and now through MPEG and others, having a, um, you know, a spec for it is, has been wonderful. So, you know, there, the idea of having, um, you know, integrations that are out there that work, that allow us to um, import and export ITMF and within that export, right, we, you know, we're saving as USD, Alembic, GLTF. Um, those are those have been really um, useful in validating how well this works in the real world. There are other technologies that we're working on and trying to figure out you know, what spec do we build around things like NERFs or you know AI generative objects. One of the other use cases is streaming data. So uh, you know, for example, Nanite at Unreal is a very powerful tool. Can we build a standard around that that can load in? You know meshes from um, from disk, and there are different tool sets and things like that. We're trying to figure out with an idea and ITMF how we can support that. That I think is a fundamental aspect of any metaverse standard, right? We want to be able to pull in unlimited data um, from disk from the network, and so we've been worrying. You know, we've been figuring out how to build that technology and make it work in you know an arbitrary way, and different renderers are only included, and you know effectively promote that as a um, new type of um, of data type within ITMF and it certainly could be of interest in other specs as well. Uh, I think I'm gonna talk also about just, you know, the projects that we're doing um, in ITMF and why they're, I think, relevant to, um, to a metaverse standards group. I mean, I've been, this slide I've been showing for, for years about, regarding our sort of goals about having, um, you know, not just data and, um, you know, and formats for video that, that describe how you could have interoperability and portability for 3D assets, but what about, you know, the, the medium itself, like what does a metaverse asset look like? And that's one of the reasons why we joined uh, the metaverse standards group. I mean, we want to bring forth everything we're doing with ITMF and provide that as a, um, you know, as, you know, as a standard that could be adapted by others. But it also is about looking at some of the other philosophical you know, implications of the metaverse. And, I, you know, I was really glad to see when we joined uh, the NSF that there's entire groups devoted to blockchain and NFTs and you know, avatars, regenerative art, and all those things are really important. So one of the goals I had with some of the content we're showing is how do those things work in the real world? How do those things apply with, with ITMF? And so when we're talking about rendering an asset or having it be portable, you can also render it on the cloud. We have a service that does that. It ingests ITMF and it spits it out, but it does store the entire hash of every asset, right? Every mesh and every texture is a Shafti's hash, and you can build an NFT around that. We partnered with Solana and Metaplex to show that. And we started to take three different um, artists, creators, and, and build things with that. And Alex Ross is a great comic book artist, is one of them. Um, you know, we literally have been sort of brainstorming how to take all the different IP that he's worked on from Marvel and Disney and others. And, you know, how does that become, you know, a metaverse asset? How does that have provenance to the creator? Um, and all of this has involved us leveraging all the technology and the tools and the pipelines we see before. We scanned in, um, you know, actors, we've had 3D artists build, you know, assets. 
And along the way, we've also been building sort of a high level um, metadata uh, system for that. That is uh, something that is similar, I guess you could say to XMP, of course, which is something that I think many of you are familiar with. It was created by Adobe and it provides a lot of metadata for the authoring side. Um, but what about what, you know, the equivalent of an IMDB, for example, for the metaverse? How do you link all these pieces together? And so we've been working on that just with the three or four different asset projects that we've had around concept tokens. Um, those allow you to link narrative content, characters, assets, all together. So if you wanted it, you know, give me a version of Superman that was in this comic book, but I want it rendered in 3D and I want to reference it and I want to know who created and who drew it. You know, there is a graph for that. That's an extension of the ITMF graph that's been um, something that's been very interesting for some of our investors and, I, and, and, uh, and partners like, you know, the studios and, and content creators. But I do think that there's um, there's something here. I mean, I think the metaverse would be pretty empty without some sort of ontology for, you know, for the creation of, of the art itself and connecting that to the creator. Um, the other uh, archive that's been built on ITMF is um, for Beeple, yeah, the NFT artist. And, you know, in his case, he's got about 5,000 pieces of artwork that have been built in 3D and Cinema 4D. And as, you know, he, he obviously launch a lot of the interest around NFTs and even a lot of metaverse pieces. So with him, everything that he's built, we've been building, again, a provenance graph that leverages ITMF. And ultimately, his goal is that you can take his art and you can remix it. And this is, you know, this is an ITMF that's uh, from one of his everydays. It's loaded in a web browser with the, the tools that we're creating. And the idea is that you can use, the, you know, the very same um, art assets that he's creating to remix them, build a simple interface on the web, which is what we're doing here, leverage ITMF to allow you to effectively just mint your own version of that. Um, so everything that's going on behind the scenes here, this is a, a web front end, it's using a, a Unreal Engine um, on the back end with the equivalent of pixel streaming to allow you to touch those ITMF files, remix it, resave it. And so generative art, I think, has a huge future, especially when you can have artists that can contribute those pieces. And again, I mean, a lot of our interest around, you know, the blockchain and metadata is also around having um, you know, royalties that can be paid out, all those other elements. And even in the physical world, I mean, a lot of the work that people's doing now is about physical artwork. Granted, some of it is digital, but that's where our, our focus on light field displays, which could be a big factor in um, forthcoming physical installations uh, come into place. And even the ability of, of collaborative art uh, where you, you know, you, 20 people can work on the same piece of art at once. I mean, that's obviously one of the mandates of the Metaverse Standard Group for how we define these pieces. Um, whether it's Unreal or Unity or 3JS, um, having the ability for that art to be touched um, in a very simple way in a portal, in AR, in whatever format there is that uh, future devices enable, and then being able to save that and record that, uh, whether it's on the blockchain or not, is a fundamental goal of what we're, what we're sort of aiming to do. And, uh, you know, and I think that, again, all of our efforts around life field labs displays, which are, are true life field displays that are running about, I don't know, um, 4,000 DPI that require ray tracing, I mean, that does sort of come to fruition with, um, with some of these projects. Uh, I think the other and the third, um, you know, archive project that we're doing that is you know, heavily leveraging ITMF, and I think this is a great example, is um, the Gene Roddenberry archive. Uh, Gene Radbury's son is a great friend of mine. He invested in this project about 10 years ago. So it's a non-commercial, non non-profit project to find, um, to basically archive everything related to Gene Radbury's work, of which, of course, Star Trek's a huge part. And the way that the, the archive has been created is that we're, we're archiving digital doubles of what's in the physical world. So in 1964, the Enterprise 11-foot model that's now in the Smithsonian was filmed on stage nine. We rebuild all those things in 3D. We have a digital double of the production model we scanned it about a million documents for Gene Roddenberry's notes and scripts and all that. And those become linked together in this, um, you know, in this system. And all of the 3D data and all the scene graph data is ITMF, the ingestion of, of, of you know, the different ships. And these, these assets are built in all these different tools. We've got artists working in Blender and Unreal. We're doing virtual production in Unreal. So kind of collating these things together is, is a challenge. And I think it's a great, um, you know, use case or a case study for how a metaverse asset like the Starship Enterprise, which is one of the hero models, right, of the, um, you know, or, or assets in this, um, uh, in this archive is being designed. So we have, of course, the production work and, and all those things that we've um, been tracking down. But then there's the in-universe version. What is the, um, you know, the, the, the platonic uh, ship of TCS Starship Enterprise? What would happen if you built it life-size? You know, could you, you know, have every corridor, everything there? And so, yeah, we, we've been doing that work. We announced it about three years ago. Um, it's gotten a lot of great attention. We've been, you know, Apple's featured this, this very asset a few times in their keynotes. 
Um, and so we're building every single room, every, um, every you know, Kirk's coffee you know, mug in uh, the one enterprise where we have all the all the uh, deck plans for. That's the motion picture one. Um, and the work is is awesome. I mean, we're building everything from the stars, the planets. Um, all of this is sort of get, you know, gets a, a, a 3D asset, a scene graph. It, it's interoperable. Um, and it's it's a really challenging project. I mean, we're about 30% of the way through building just this one um, enterprise from the motion picture era. And I think there's about three more years of work. So this is a multi-decade project. And what's been interesting is that as we've been building it and working on it, um, we've seen, you know, a lot of um, movement in, in, you know, I guess standardization for the metaverse. And so bringing all this to bear and, and at least having this as a test case for how you'd want to, you know, deliver a metaverse experience. I mean, this is more like a museum piece where you'd walk into the history of, of the ship um, and how it was created in the show. And this, these are the interactive experiences. So we've leveraged both Omniverse and Unreal to provide interactive experiences. Whatever tool the artists are creating, they provide little hooks for basic interactivity. Obviously the work with, um, you know, GLX and behaviors and GLTFs, interesting. Blueprints and Unreal, interesting. Omniverse, um, you know, the, you know, the kit in there is interesting. Maybe some sort of global standard around that would work to get around some of our, you know, issues around standardization. We've just tried to keep things at a very high level in ITMF nodes for very simple behaviors, whether it's animation or triggers. Uh, physics, of course, um, are, are an important aspect, and it's great to see the, um, you know, the physics that are already in place in USD. We're effectively um, taking that as a subset. Um, but as we, you know, go further in this uh, in this project, it becomes really, you know, interesting and complicated when you start adding avatars, characters. Um, you know, we while we can replicate the ships perfectly, the the concept of having um, entire the entire show um, recreated is is really interesting. I mean that that gets to you know how do you recreate um, again you know content that is you know has fidelity for for humans and actors and the like. Uh, even the timeline of Star Trek's challenging. There's there multiple different eras, so this is a time lapse of all the different assets in the archive, um, just for the uh, you, know, you know Captain Kirk era, and you can see that they overlap. What's, what's interesting is about a week from now, all of the things that you're seeing here are going to be live and put on a portal. We're, we're doing our first release of the Rhino Beer Archive. It'll be on a web page. All the ITMF files that are driving all the, and there's about 14 different enterprises, um, will be something that you'll be able to touch and experience initially in 2D and initially just through a, um, effectively the equivalent of pixel streaming. But, you know, that's something that allows us to, uh, to test the waters and see how these experiences work without having to worry about the delivery of the format into um, a specific um, renderer. I mean, that's where having server-side rendering and cloud-based rendering helps. Um, ITMF is designed for that. Uh, and I think these experiences, which again, we have multiple real-time renderers, multiple offline renderers that can be plugged in, um, in you know, including Unreal, including Unity. Um, the idea is that we have this cohesiveness where we can take the material data, the behavior data, and just translate it back and forth in these different pieces. This is Unreal in the uh, interactive experiences. And it's, it's really, um, you know, a, a, a fascinating uh, journey. It's been wonderful and, and excited to work on. And again, this is um, some of the work that's being put out next week. Where you'll see there's the J.J. Abrams movies, there's uh, the current TV shows, the shows from 2005. We're effectively recreating 60 years of history in the metaverse. And we're also taking a lot of the materials that were never produced and published, like these designs from the, um, from the show. And this is what the interface will look like. Um, again, it's, it's leveraging these streams that are pulling in different assets. You can see some of the menus here, um, but it, it'll be a lot of fun. And so a, a, you know, a week from now, this, this site will be live and you'll be able to play with these, these different pieces, but it is a living, breathing archive, right? So as we build more things, as we build uh, more experiences, uh, the idea is that those things become explorable. Now, a web browser, a, a, you know, an AR, VR device, those are all, I think, tractable um, you know, experiences. I mean, there is you know, a web-based, um, you know, WebXR is an interesting way of, of allowing this to flourish outside of a 2D um, interface. Uh, you can see here there's about 100 different ships that are being put out there. And then there's also, the, you know, what do we do with these, with these assets that are scanned in from the real world? And the archiving part of it is very much about that. Um, some of the work that we're doing around NERFs and, and virtual production involve, like, how do we capture, you know, these, this is all from the Paul Allen estate. These are the actual real props in the films and the movies. Um, next week, as part of the uh, uh, piece of work that we're putting out there, we were brought onto the set of um, Star Trek Picard. If you haven't seen the show, do not avert your eyes here, but this is one of the sets that was in the last episode that we scanned in. It's the Enterprise D bridge, and it's perfectly recreated as a, as a scan model, but we also have it fully 
recreated and working digitally. And there's a lot of overlap between building physical and, um, you know, and digital, you know, assets. And, and all of that is something that, again, if you're thinking about a metaverse experience, you know, you, you want to have these overlays where you can switch between um, what was, was, you know, what was something that was from the, from our world, what's the informational and, you know, overlay on that and what's the experience in universe. So this is an example of, again, some of the things that you can do inside of the, um, inside of these scenes. We have everything is annotated, they function and they work. Uh, you know, you can, you can literally explore, you know, from Cranny, there's, uh, you know, flushing plumbing in the enterprise. It's all, it's all a really interesting challenge because again, a lot of the digital double work that's being done for, you know, industrial use cases, we're kind of applying to, you know, to, the, to this fictional ship. And, you know, with Omniverse, I'm Richard Karras as, a, as an advisor to this project. And, you know, he's um, director of the Omniverse um, team at, uh, at NVIDIA. And so, again, you know, bridge, bridging Omniverse, bridging Unreal to ITMF has been um, a really interesting learning experience. And, you know, there's obviously Omniverse Creator, which is a great tool for USD editing. Um, but these are all pieces that I think are, are you know, elements that teach us what we'd want to have in a functioning spec. The reason why we're here is that there are things that are not quite, that, that aren't standards that are still missing from, you know, any of these pieces. And ITMF does provide at least a, a starting point, I think, for exploring those, but there's so much more to be done. Um, the last sort of round of, of um, examples I want to show is, is actual virtual production use cases um, with, with this, uh, this project. So we started right from the beginning with the pilot episode, recreating it, bringing the director who's still alive, Robert Butler, on set. Uh, we have real performers, it, you know, with with uh, costumes that are created first digitally in Marvelous Designer, then created in the real world, rescanned in, um, and it's you know, it's, it's a fascinating um, you know test of of how you can pull in um, a, a fully functioning avatar that matches the characters from the show that fits in that world that can be filmed, and more importantly, once it's filmed, can it be experienced volumetrically in 3D? So you can see here on the left is the 1964 uh, film shoot on the right is the uh, digital set. And it's, I mean, everyone that's that's been part of Star Trek history has looked at the things that we're building here and said, yeah, this is how I remember it. This is how it would have looked. So it, it, it's, it's a great, um, you know, testament to the fact that there's, um, you know, these tools and this, and this sort of um, mechanism for bringing in both physical and digital assets and mixing those together in these novel ways. And even building you know, these, these kinds of concept pieces, which we did back last year, you know, using leverage, using the Ronnie archive assets and just hitting print, like let's render this on, uh, you know, on, on the cloud service. There's a little, you know, uh, you know Ethereum um, entry that, that you know, specifies where all these three assets came from. You can look it up. Crazily enough, one of the um, scenes from the uh, Star Trek motion picture that was redone uh, with the cloud service with ITMF, uh, you know, also has a frame and, and a bunch of assets that are tied and put on the um, put on the blockchain. So again, we're taking things from Star Trek literature, comics, recreating those in ITMF. The ontology part of it is interesting, and then of course, when it comes to characters and avatars and face, facial movements, there's a whole you know spec there. I think that we should be exploring. Um, when we had to bring Spock to life, um, we, you know, we had Adam Nimoy, the son of uh, Leonard Nimoy, advise us on how to do that. We brought in an actor, Lawrence Selleck, did all these prosthetics, um, and then scanned that, those prosthetics in um, so we could do a, a fully live, real-time digital double of, of Spock. And the results are pretty awesome. And this is all real-time. This is all with the um, scan prosthetics uh, laid out over the performance. It's using machine learning to basically generate a 3D model. It's not a deep fake, it's a 3D uh, model. We can also uh, spit that out as a nerf. And once the actors are done with their performance, um, we can bring in that scene and you can see how the fidelity looks and we can then relight it. We can um, look at it from any angle. And that's, uh, again, something that's, that's spit out as ITMF. So whether this is for virtual production or re-rendering, or just for the end users that want to be able to experience a volumetric scene, uh, you know, these things are all being tested and there, there's a lot of things that we're, that are still missing. Like we're, we're very open to having more input on, on how to take all this technology, but it's, it's already pretty, um, pretty cool. And, and I think that it's, it's been, you know, leveraged in a way that allows us to, to sort of also explore where these, you know, do A, B and C testing on, for example, let's do green screen, let's do nerfs on the, on the top right, you're seeing a, a nerf capture on the bottom right is a full CG, um, you know, render. And it's, it's interesting to sort of compare all these things together. What we found is that a high quality scan of an actual performer in the physical outfit that can then uh, be fed into an ML pipeline and then re 
rendered is one of the best ways to get essentially photographic high quality, you know, avatars or performances um, in a scene graph. And, you know, again, I think that the work with NERFs is super interesting. I mean, we, we do want to support NERF rendering. We have um, work that we're doing with Luma Labs, for example, um, to scan in environments. But ultimately, what you need is almost a reverse rendering system that can take physical um, data from the real world and give you back material data uh, and build a, a material graph out of that. Um, a lot of the work that we started in CG, like this was something we did last year, was very popular. We did a CG asset of a character. We used the CG asset in ITMAP to 3D print the model film it live, you know, biometrically. Uh, and this is an example of a nerf that we're using for a scene of an upcoming production um, for the Ron Archive that'll be out next week. We went back to Nevada, filmed this scene, it's really well known where Kirk is buried. And we had drones capture that, turn it into a nerf. Um, Luma has a, a, a format called dot .luma that you can load into Unreal right now. We're working on an Octane integration so we can then bring these things in and render um, really cool uh, nerf capture data. And playing around with that data in the scene graph, I think, is, uh, is, is very informative. I mean, nerfs are brand new, but just having, even if it's a black box, even if a neural render or neural optics is a black box or generative art, it's still very useful. But ultimately, we want to be able to have the material properties for it. We want to be able to render it. And even as we're dealing with characters, I mean, being able to age up or down a character like, like Spock, in this case, the uh, performer that we used for the archive, is, again, you know, data that can leverage a lot of different pieces of technology. So as we're doing this project, you know, we had to literally age the character up and down. Um, you can see here is a 3D file on set when we were filming him, we built an iPad uh, interface to IPMF that allows us to control the virtual set, um, have the, um, the face scan and um, any digital prosthetics added together in real time. And from a director's point of view, it's pretty cool technology. It's something that we've only had working for about six or seven months. But I think that the intersection of virtual technology, a virtual production, the metaverse, and um, and digital doubles and face replacement are are really fascinating topics. Uh, next week, this is the uh, content that we're going to be releasing um, in uh, you know in tandem with the last episode of Picard. All looks really cool, and it's something that again uh, wouldn't be possible without ITMF as a um, interchange format for all these different elements. Um, and the scenes that we're building are, are incredibly ambitious. There's a lot of elements in ITMF that relate to scattering generative art and the like. And uh, and so, yeah, that's that's sort of a top-down view of virtual production in uh, ITMF. And I will pause there and uh, open the, um, uh, open to, you know, having questions and any other thoughts or feedback on the presentation. So, awesome. so Jules, uh, I was wondering if you could sort of give us your perspective on um, what the strengths and weaknesses of ITMF are relative to using, um, you know, just GLTF or just using USD? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I think with, with GLTF, you know, and we've been obviously a big part of, of, you know, pushing that format forward, I've been advocating for GLTF to become much more like USD. In other words, like we want to have quads so we can do subdivision surfaces and, and, and do sub D, right? <laughs> I mean, if you don't have that, you're, I think GLTF is amazing as a, a, you know, sort of as a, you know, transmission format or, or baked format. Um, but if you consider even that, you know, what's missing from all these things is probably like a really robust camera system. Like we want to have ray trace shaders for cameras. Like we built a camera OSL shader. We've been talking to, you know, to the Arnold team and the Redshift team and others about, can we just have a standardized ray trace camera that allows you to then build any camera model that you want? And that's, for example, something that we, you know, that is missing in, in, in other specs. USD doesn't have the material system. I mean, there's, you know, material X is coming. We love it. We're absolutely supporting it. But, you know, if you want to have custom OSL shaders um, or, or, or custom BRDS, how does that work? You know, and so there, there's a lot of pieces where there are things, you know, for example, even in USD or GLTF, how do you do an SDF? How do you, you know, does GLTF, sorry, does uh, GLTF, for example, support uh, procedural shaders, right? You know, even in GLSL, those things may be coming, but they're not there today. So ITMF is, is ultimately, I mean, it loads a mesh as a, as a, or even a full scene as a USD or a GLTF. And then those other elements that are missing, like the cameras or other pieces get added on top of there. And right now I'd say the primary strengths have been, you know, if effectively scene graph types that are not well-defined as meshes. That includes, um, you know, sign distance fields, neural objects, um, you know, and of course things like cameras. And of course, there's a lot of other pieces that relate to interactivity and, um, and production rendering. So I, I do imagine that those things could all be extensions to either format, but the idea is maybe ITMF can provide 
you know, a, a you know, sort of a, a, a group of these um, pieces that can then be adopted in, you know, into sub, uh, into the subformats. So for example, with GLTF, we did propose an instancing extension, which does work, but that we were able to load scenes like the forest and other things you were seeing as a GLTF, but it has to be adopted. So I would say that those are some of the missing pieces. I can certainly list some more, but that gives you a general sense of why, um, you know, we've had it, I guess, leverage and build things on top of GLTF and USD to get a complete renderable scene that's uh, interoperable. But, but I guess my my question is <clears throat> um, the things that you've mentioned. Let's say let's let's take uh, USD right. Um, USD has a robust extension system. Um, we've made a variety of extensions to USD. Um, you know, you mentioned materials. We've we've put um, MDL at NVIDIA into um, into USD. So why should the community want to head towards ITMF instead of um, taking the ideas that you've developed and using them to extend USD. I think, so it's interesting. When we when Disney first invested us in 2016, we talked to the Pixar team and we proposed exactly that to USD. So here we are seven years later. And I mean, you know, it's a process. Like, I mean, sure, if USD had everything, I mean, like, I don't want to recreate, you know, physics in, in ITMF. So, USD adds physics, you know, NVIDIA and Apple actually agreed on that. That's fantastic. Like, I, th I think that the more that gets into the subformats, the better. I mean, that, that at least would, would help, hopefully help us provide some sort of standardization. So IDEA and ITMF is there to, I mean, it's, it's simple to take many pieces that we have and bring those into those other formats. So if there are things that, let's say, a group would agree upon that are, that are missing, for example, you know, camera shaders, terrific. I just think that ITMF has to exist until there is a day when USD has it all. And I don't even know how that how that works. I don't know exactly who's in charge of, of the canonical, you know, who, you know, materials that are in USD. I mean, there's obviously, you know, as you said, there's MDL as a um, material type in USD. But what if you're, you know, looking at at you know at, at OSL or other things? I mean, it's it's sort of, you know, we'd love there to, to be a, a consensus on those pieces. And so what we've done with ITMF is to provide a, a working version of of those missing pieces and where those things can can um, you know sort of be um, can be referenced. But then there are also just things that are more complicated, like for example, you know, the extension for streaming data. Um, maybe that goes to the USD, or where where does the provenance stuff go? Where does the NFT minting piece go? Where does the uh, you know the metadata for humans and characters go? Does that all go into USD, or does it go into something that's an umbrella above it? And right now, for us, that's you know we're building that ourselves. We're building it with the other members of IDEA and ITMF. But by all means, like if this could be adopted by MPEG or in USD directly or GLTF, that would be awesome. I mean, we're- but another, another alternative, for, for example, for, for provenance is to simply um, develop a set of USD schemas to um, directly express that information, right? We, do we need a different um, format? No, I mean, I think- that Or do we I, just- I, I, think that, that, I think the, the only issue with USD, I'll be honest, is that is, it's a, it's a pretty heavy format. So if you're, if you're, I mean, part of the reason why I think GLTF has been popular is it's lightweight. Now, I think the perfect system would be a lightweight system that, I mean, obviously USD has Draco support, which is great. Um, I mean, I, I think that you could probably take the metadata schema that's in ITMF, and as I said, it's XML, right? It can be adopted to JSON, it can be adopted to USD elements. We can embed these things in a USD file, but does that ensure that every endpoint is going to be able to read USD? And I'm not sure, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think in some ways where, the reason why we support multiple leaf formats in an ITMF file is that it's really the author's choice. If you want to send something down as a, as a GLTF and not a USD for whatever reason, um, maybe because the USD runtime library is pretty heavy, then that's part of the spec as well. And, and so those are the those are the things that we've been thinking about, and I'm sure this group should should be um, thinking about as well. But there's a lot of what's in ITMF. Sure, we could we could put that as USD schema. Is that exactly what the industry is wanting us to do in every case? You know, that's where the GLTF and USD, you know, overlap is, is, is interesting. I think that USD is, a, is it's just a complex system to build even at an endpoint. And so that's something that if we could address that better, that would be great. Um, but but if you if you say um, somebody who tries to understand ITMF has to understand ITMF and everything embedded, which includes USD, then haven't you just said that if I want to understand it's a great point. ITMF, it's, it's, but, it's right, it hasn't become any simpler. It, it is if you have a profile that says it's just GLTF, and that's exactly what we've done. So there are sub profiles where it's not even GLTF; it's it's a 360 degree render. It's a 
you know, and so you can collapse things down. I mean, you can basically take a USD and you can turn it into a GLTF. That's a function that we have in there. We also support FBX and, and the like. So there is a, a, you know, sort of a distillation step. And that's why we want to have a mastery format that's as high quality as possible. And that is what we use for, you know, final frame rendering or, 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 or you know, the canonical ground truth of an asset. But it, the whole reason we joined the GLTF working group is to uh, figure out a way where we could distill the GLTF and GLTF viewers could then get some version of ITMF that has as much as possible embedded. So with that in mind, that's where you know, the MPEG group was, was looking at it. Well, what are the different profiles? What, what, if you, you know, what if you can't load even a 3D scene? Like what, what's, the, what's the alternative? Is that a NERF, for example, right? And you do have Luma with a full web-based NERF viewer. And so even with an ITMF, the idea of, of, of sort of this, this high level, you know, this is a bounding you know, volume of what's in the scene. It could be a NERF, it could be a GLTF, it could be a USD, it could be more. I mean, these are principles that should be considered anyway for the MSF, but that's why, yeah, you can have a much simpler runtime or playback if you say, I want level one or two or three, and that's just a GLTF or, or something even simpler. Right, but we, uh, I mean, we've just talked about distilling uh, USD to GLTF. Um, that's uh, an effort that's well underway. So I guess I'm asking, um, assuming that's moving forward um, and, assuming that works well, then what does, why should ITMF be its own format rather than uh, uniting around taking those pieces and putting them into um, into USD appropriately? Well, let's put it this way. If you wanted to take, if you can get GLTF and USD, right, to have a distillation piece that's, that's fully part baked into the USD spec, and we take everything in ITMF and bake that in the USD spec, that would be fine. I mean, I'm i would be great. I, it doesn't have to sit outside of it. It's just, it's existed for all these years because there's still a lot of pieces and we can go down that list and we can provide, you know, use cases as I was doing, right? Which was like, well, we, when we can do all of our work and it's just a USD you know, file or it's, or, or the GLTF parts covered, great. But, you know, I think there's a lot there. I mean, I think, you, you know, the, again, I mean, if it's all USD schema, that's a, you know, format, you know, transcription change for us. It's not, it's not really that complex. And a lot of what's in ITMF is in the XML. It's in that graph, right? So that's something that could be applied inside of a USD file. But I guess part of it also is the unit testing and the rectification. Like, you know, there already, if you load a USD that comes out of Arnold, you load a USD that comes out of Omniverse, I mean, you know, they're not necessarily going to even look the same. I mean, I, I think there's also those, those things. So, I mean, what we're part of this group, um, you know, part of our goal motivation being this group is how can we help figure out a single standard um, with all the elements that ITMF has or the ones that are at least useful for, for, for you know, in the real world and bring that into whatever format emerges. And I think that there's absolutely, um, you know, a path towards that. But, you know, I, I look to, to everyone else to tell me whether or not there's, you know, how, you know, how viable that is, especially, I mean, there are things that are complex, for example, I mean, the nerf piece is interesting. Like, I think there should be a nerf extension. I'm sure that's something for USD to consider. But Again, I mean, solving something like having ray traced shaders for the camera, like how do we do that? Can we put that into USD and call that a day? I mean, those are the things we'd like to see happen. So we're perfectly happy to provide everything that's in the things we're doing and see if we can get those into a single unified format. And everything that goes into USD would go into ITMF anyway. So there's no real, you know, discrepancy from our perspective of having that in there. As long as there's also, you know, why don't we yeah. let Guido? Yeah, have yes. a, yeah, I was going to say thank you. I wanted to let I wanted to let Guido and and yeah. Arian uh, weigh in here as well. Go ahead, yeah. Guido. My my question is about I, I'm looking at the spec right now. So there is a, obviously tons of specification and notes tied between geometry and in particular material. There's a lot of different, uh, but actually I was interested more about uh, does uh, ITMF also brings other concept in terms of like scene aggregation, like uh, referencing override the some of the concept that uh, they're in USD or is fundamentally a specification of a, of a number of schemas in different in different areas like geometry like shading and all of that and then is a, on a very simple kind of a scene graph where they're just like you know things are like depending with each other like in a hierarchical structure or there is because yeah. that's that's really what is about USD is not that much about the schemas of USD it's about the composition and the yeah. scene aggregation aspect GLTF maybe is more about uh, more specific about that. So anyway, what, 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 how do you see that piece? So I think that everything that's in USD as far as being able to, you know, for example, you have purpose um, you know, renders, right? You know, which is great for, for, for USD. That is something I'd love to have as a, as a full spec in GLTF. So, you know, you can have references and that's the point of an ITMF that's packaged. I mean, one of the things that I, we didn't talk about is we have a binary format. Of course, you have USDZ, which zips things up. But, you know, think about the fact that like a zip file, if it has chunking, 
might mess up um, you know, streamable MP4 file. One of the reasons why we, we built a, you know, a, a sort of trunkless um, you know, virtual disk system is so we could load in these crazier things. There is a, you can have a full reference to a scene and that could be a jail tip. It could also be a nerf. It could also be the OC file. It could also be something that's totally procedural done in OSL shaders that's done on the of surfaces. And you can have nodes that are scriptable. We chose Lua, but you could put any scripting language. You can write anything in WebAssembly, for example, that, that you know, effectively flips the, uh, flips the scene wrap into something and everything within USD itself. I mean, we've done, you know, we're expecting that to be supported as a, you know, as a subtype or a sub piece in, uh, in ITMF. But I think the idea of having the very simple idea of just having a nerf that represents an asset and having that work all the way down to the, um, to the, to the, you know, to the browser being able to traverse up the graph into all the different pieces that went into it. I mean, that's important. So, but to your point, yes, the idea of, of composition is critically important, especially between radically different tools and DCCs like Unreal or Unity and, and Blender and all those things don't necessarily all map into the USD schema. Um, they, they could if we were to, to look at it from that perspective, but um, even the work in ITMF where we're doing totally remote streaming where we take the, the protocol and we send it over the wire and it shows up as a node in, in, um, you know, in Blender, um, you know, that's something of course that Omniverse has been kind of doing, but we have a, a spec for that as well that, that, you know, that supports those elements. So there's a lot there, but to, your, to answer your point, yeah, the, um, the idea of staging composition and referencing is pretty critical to ITMF. Thanks, Jules. Uh, so we're almost at time. Uh, Ariane, I wanted to give you a chance to weigh in as well. Uh, yes. So in response to some of the questions about why USD versus why ITMF, I um, wanted to comment on my experience investigating ITMF itself for MPEG. And that is that, um, you know, while um, ITMF, as you say, is not necessarily consensus based. What it does do that I don't think USD does is allow artists who are very particular about the tools they use, about the formats they use to capture precisely what it is that they want to um, represent with different media formats, um, they're going to be absolutely insisting on the continued use of those tools. I don't think you're gonna find a community of artists that are all gonna agree on a certain paint brush to use or a certain paint um, manufacture process. Um, I think what ITMF does is it preserves the flexibility for the creatives to do what they do best with a variety of tools. And that was critical in our considerations on what to start with in MPEG. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think that you're gonna find that USD is going to meet the requirements of every single artist who wishes to, um, you know, express themselves and they get paid to express themselves or what they do best with different tools. And the, and the correlation to that experience um, is, is what something I try to explain um, in one of the recent uh, presentations is that in MPEG itself, you know, we started off with the goal of creating a standard around an HDR curve. And that worked well until some creatives said, no, I don't want to use that HDR curve. I want to use this other HDR curve. And, and that just blossomed into now what is a, a, a a larger collection of HDR curves, all because the artists want to preserve their own creative intent. And I and I just don't see how any one size fits all um, sub format as, as Jules referred to them um, will ever address all the concerns of the artists. So anyway, those are just my thoughts. And um, by you get what you pay for. Those are my two cents. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>